Donna I cross. Boy, things are moving quick, moving, moving quick. And I oh, take a deep breath and just relax because you know what? I got to be so thankful for all of the people who are working so hard on this case. You have content creators. They're literally working through the night, through the day, trying to find info, trying to get the word out, trying to find people to help with the actual searches. You just can't commend them enough because they work so hard and so diligently. They form bonds. They build sources. They get info and they get it out. And they do an amazing job at doing it. I try to do the very same. And I'll tell you, just from my experience, and I'm sure they would agree with me, you get emotional. It hits you right in the heart. You get tired. But you keep going, no matter the mood, the emotion, the thoughts, whatever it might be. You even misspeak sometimes. Or you say something that hits home to someone else because maybe you just didn't say it the way you wanted to. But I want everybody to know, like legitimately, there are so many people that truly care about, about Donna Cross and this case and putting the puzzle pieces together and getting justice. I take great pride, great pride in seeing the work that they do and just trying to be a part of it. I'm thankful and blessed. And I guarantee you, Donna looking down from above and the family and the people who truly care about this case and the individuals involved in it will all stand up and say how amazing the help has been. Mayor Hayes, I'm an ex-convict. It's not really the type of case I like to discuss, especially considering it hits home with me. Donna Cross was literally a friend that was in a true crime group that I had created and ran. We talked. We talked about true crime. She had a really true interest in true crime. We discussed real life. We talked about things that maybe we didn't even want to share with others, but because we had built that little bond, and I know, I know, it wasn't a handshake, it wasn't a big hug, but you know what, we built a bond, and it was amazing. And that's what many of these content creators will tell you. We build bonds with people, we build communities, we build families. We care. We legitimately care. As you know... It's being break, broken by many, and it's all coming from different angles. And it's fast moving. There has been an arrest. It is clearly looking like it's tied to the Donna Cross disappearance and then the body being found and the case now being built. Where is this going to lead? Where is it going to go? I have a feeling that the wheels are turning and it's going to get crazy, and I... I personally, this is just me, but I could see it in the other creators as well. It's a hard one to talk about. It's very difficult. None of us want to do this. This is not the types of things that we want to talk about. We want to talk about successful findings of people alive and the, the great endings of true crime and without people physically being hurt or harmed or loss of life. But in Washington County, Missouri, the PCA was filed, the affidavit, probable cause affidavit. I went over that briefly in my last video, and now I'm actually going to go over the felony complaints that are filed and written to the court. The state of Missouri versus David R. Kleekamp obviously resides at 10040 Shirley School Road in Potosi, Missouri. 86 
I'm sorry I said that wrong. 63664 is the zip code. Felony complaint comes now. The prosecuting attorney of the County of Washington, State of Missouri, being duly sworn upon oath and upon information and belief, stating that there is probable cause to believe that. Count 1. The defendant committed the Class D felony a possession of a controlled substance punishable upon conviction in that on or about January 17th, 2024, in the county of Washington State of Missouri, the defendant knowingly possessed methamphetamine, a controlled substance, knowing of its presence and nature. It's pretty clear cut, ladies and gentlemen, what that means. He had a narcotic, he knew what it was, knew he had it. Count two, the defendant committed the class E felony of unlawful use of a weapon, punishable, in that on or about January 17th, 2024, in the county of Washington State of Missouri, the defendant knowingly possessed a Savage Mark II 22 caliber rifle, a firearm, while also possessing the narcotic that we spoke about in count one, knowing of its presence and nature. He knew he had not only the narcotic, but he also knew he had this firearm, a rifle, in his possession, which is a felony charge. You cannot have a firearm anywhere near a narcotic. It's a felony charge. Count 3 falls pretty much right in the same lines as Count 2, except for this time, it's an actual diamond back 9mm handgun, a firearm, while also in the possession of the narcotic. He knew he had them. But let me kind of just bring focus before we move on to this, and it's very particularly worded which i think is going to show it's just my opinion because normally it wouldn't be worded this way but i believe it's going to show here in the very near future what could be coming felony of unlawful use of a fire unlawful use not possession of, use. Pretty key wording in my opinion. Let's get to count four. This is the smallest charge. It's the defendant committed the class D misdemeanor of unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia, punishable upon conviction in that on or about January 17th, 2024, in the county of Washington State of Missouri, the defendant knowingly possessed a pipe, certain type of pipe, which was drug paraphernalia. He knew he had it. He knew why he had it. He had it with the intent to use it to inhale a controlled substance of an in imitation controlled substance. I think it's actually kind of crazy that they have to put in there that he had the intent to inhale. I think most of us could probably get the gist of that. But, there you go. That's the small base. He had a drug paraphernalia. So he had four counts right now. The facts that form the basis for this information and belief are contained in the statement of facts filed at the same time, here within, made a part of and submitted as a basis upon this court may find the existence of probable cause. Meaning that this actually goes with the probable cause for the reasoning for the arrest. They did file a witness list separately from this. Now, they also requested a bond of 75000 cash only, which... That seems about right for these types of charges from my 
past and my experiences. So I could agree that these are probably about normal. Now, they also request a GPS with house arrest required parting. Uh, if he bonds out, he has to have the ankle bracelet on to monitor him at all points of time. Now, they make a clear statement here stating the defendant is a person of interest who was in possession of important information in an ongoing investigation and definitely avoided cooperation with law enforcement because he said he knew he had warrants and did not wish to be arrested. Defendant should be viewed as an extreme flight risk, which normally when they say something of that nature, they should be viewed as an extreme flight risk. They go two routes. They either set your bail or bond so high that they really know that you either can't afford it or if you do post that bail or bond, it's enough financial that you just can't go anywhere because you can't afford to lose that. Now, the range of punishment for a Class D felony, which, if you remember, the Class D felony goes back up to Count 4, which was the uh, firearm. No. Yeah, the firearm. You talk about imprisonment imprisonment in the Department of Corrections for a term of years not less than two nor more than seven or by confinement in the county jail for a term to not exceed one year could be a fine of up to $10,000. The Class E felony, which would be the actual narcotics, is imprisonment in the Department of Corrections for a term not less than two years, but not more than four, or by confinement in the county jail for to not exceed one year, fine of $10,000. Most times, ladies and gentlemen, nobody could be held in a county jail after sentencing for over a year. At that point, they send you off to the Department of Corrections. The misdemeanor is a fine to not exceed $500. So, I mean, if we really want to break this down, I think it's pretty obvious that this man, because of his past track record, has an issue with narcotics. And because he has a past history, he should not be in possession of any type of firearms. But what really stands out about this is the fact that they clearly state that he had, at minimum, information in regards to a case, which is probably why they got the search warrant and kicked his doors in. This man is on their radar. There's something about this because as you know when we went over the initial probable cause the search warrant was issued because they were looking for a specific bag like a coin bag and they seem to have found that in the home We know that the main majority of her property was found outside. And I'm sure more details are going to be broken. And I'm sure other people have better information in regards to that. That's why I always say, don't hesitate to venture around and watch other people's content. Because they're going to have information that... Some of us don't have yet. I just know they're based off of my experience and my background. If they did not feel as though this individual had some participation, they would have 
just arrested him on his warrants. But to see that they actually searched the home tells me there's far more to this individual's involvement or knowledge of what happened to Donna. Because they literally got a warrant to search the home. An arrest warrant, you could walk anywhere on your property, you could walk anywhere in the grocery store, anywhere, and if they ID you, they can arrest you. They don't need to go obtain a search warrant. They did that for a reason. And it's going to be very interesting for all of us to learn what led them to that. I mean, I would have a feeling it's going to be some sort of video, it's going to be... Something is going to lead them to why that search warrant was obtained. Things are slowly starting to make more sense on to why it took time to get the search going and everything of that nature. Because it does sound, based off of some other things I'm hearing, that the body possibly was not where it was found at an earlier time, it came later, as maybe the search had been conducted and the body wasn't found in that place at that time, but later the body miraculously ended up where it was. I mean, all of us in our minds could piece that together. That's called the body was moved from one location to another called a dump. Which ties me up on the inside. This young lady trying to overcome, overcome, not only personal issues, we all have them, we've all been around the block, nobody's perfect, but on top of that, she was trying to overcome literal brain injuries. She went to the hospital, for God's sakes, ill, hoping to get the help that she needed, and then go into a long-term recovery. She was making steps in the right direction. I don't care if people say, well, that's happened before. So what? It was happening right then and now. She was making strides to go in the right direction in life and get the help that she needed. Instead, this is how it all played out. It's where we're at today. Not only the loss of a beautiful young lady, but now a family devastated by that loss and a community of individuals like you, like me, like others out and about that are all trying to figure out the why. If you really think about does the how really matter? Does the how really matter at the end of the day? It's the why that so many of us can't grasp that hurts us the most. It's the why that took Don across his life. And I hope, I hope, I, I really do. Like, I sit here and I truly, in my heart, hope it wasn't over something so small and worthless compared to a person's life. A grandmother, a mother. What is worth taking that? What at the end of the day would be worth taking that? So, to wrap it all up, I am truly appreciative of everybody's hard work, everybody's diving in and giving it their heart and soul to help Donna, Donna's family, and everybody surrounding this case. And I'm sorry if I come across as tired and maybe misspeak when I do try to express myself. I I as well, I'm emotionally torn, I'm tired. And it's nothing against anybody out there. None of my 
video rants or anything that I'm saying is directed at any individual at all. No channel, no creator, no journalist, no nobody. Nobody. I just like them and everybody else. I need justice to be served so that Donna and her family can lay peacefully and know we did all we could. All we could to show her how much she meant to us. May our haste, my next convict, thank you to everybody. I appreciate all of you.